hosting us. We're really, we're really pleased to be here. So um, I think Lily's going to share her screen. We'll, we'll uh, get, get going with a couple slides. So we just wanted to give you an overview of the plan today, um, of the session plan. So we're going to give you a, give you a bit of a story of the, what we are doing in this transforming cities from within learning journey, but also hopefully some of the, some of how it feels. So um, we'll give you a little bit of a glimpse into the, both the look and the feel uh, and the quality of the experience that our team's been, been working to create with this, with this uh, learning journey that we're in. So do a bit of welcome in arriving, uh, talk a little, Kyla and I will share a little bit about the transforming cities from within journey. Um, each of Mumby and Maggie and Lily are going to share a question that we're holding in this work that we'll be hopefully in conversation with all of you about and then we'll close together. So each of the team members is going to introduce themselves a little bit more as we go, but I just wanted to, to show you everybody here. So um, we've got most of us are here today. Um, Lily is here and Maggie is here and Mumby and Kyla and I are here and uh, Rob and Moira are also part of our team, Rob and Weinsberg and Moira Quayle are also part of our team, but they're not here with us today. So um, I'll do my brief intro. My name is Lindsay, um, I use she, her pronouns and I'm coming in from the traditional and unceded territories of the Shishal people, which is just a little bit north of Vancouver, British Columbia. And one of the things that I'm, we thought we'd share something that, we're, that each of us are working on right now that we're pretty excited about. So I'm actually teaching about 75 undergrad students this semester in an online class focused on community-based adult education for social and ecological justice. And it's been quite a while actually since I've spent four months with 75 18 to 22 year olds. And it's really inspiring and incredible how they're thinking about um, the intersections of social and ecological justice in their lives and in their work. And, and I've been really inspired by them over the last few months. So that's a little bit about me. Um, Lily, I'm gonna hand it over to you now to open us up if you're ready. Sounds great, thanks, Lindsay. Um, hi, everyone. And um, I'll just introduce myself really quickly as well. So my name's Lily Raphael and uh, my pronouns are she, her. And I'm currently calling in from the unceded um, territories of the Simsham people of Kitsum Kalem um, up in Northern BC, um, otherwise known as Terrace BC. And normally I'd be calling in from the unceded ancestral homelands of the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh peoples um, in so-called Vancouver BC and our um, UBC research project. Um, so the research project being based out of UBC, which is located on Musqueam lands. And I just want to acknowledge the original stewards of these lands and I'm grateful for their um, continued um, and ongoing care and um, protection and defense of these lands. And uh, so we're going to open it up kind of in the way that we would start one of our, um, our um, transforming cities from within uh, sessions. So if uh, someone, I don't know if anyone's posted the link to the slides yet in the chat, um, but it's going to be a bit interactive. So we just wanted to um, see how people are arriving today. So uh, you can enter and go into, I think it's slide four. I can't quite see the slides right now. Maybe I'll exit really quickly. And uh, we can just see how people are arriving into the space today. So we have energized, curious, a few excited, awesome, distracted, also okay, motivated, curious and a bit tired, intrigued. Ooh, someone's also cooking food. I'm excited to hear more about what they're cooking. Relaxed and interested. Distracted also, distracted. <laughs> I hope whatever is distracting you is at least good distractions. Um, if you also wanna look on slide five, there's a few coming in there. Excited to share and meet some new faces. Awesome. Let's see, 
a bit fatigued, but in a good mood. That's good. Great. Well, I'm really excited to be here with all of you. And we're going to actually, um, before we go any further, we're going to do just a quick embodiment exercise. Um, so we, this is how we start all of our sessions. Um, and given that all the work that we do is um, within a body, um, we find it's important to bring our bodies along with us as we're doing this work, um, especially towards systems transformation. So it's a way for us to remind ourselves that we ourselves in our bodies are part of the systems that we're living in and also part of the systems that um, we're working to, to change. So I'm going to invite you, feel free to, um, you can turn off your screen if you'd like. I'm going to leave mine on just so you can, you can um, follow along with me. But I'm going to invite you uh, to stand up if that's um, comfortable for you, or you can also stay seated if you'd like. And uh, we'll just do a quick waking up the body exercise. And this will help in just resetting the central nervous system. So hopefully those who are feeling a bit fatigued um, or a bit distracted might feel a bit more grounded. So you're just going to stand up or if you're sitting in your chair, um, just try to sit nice and tall. And you can close your eyes or place them or focus them softly in front of you. And have your arms just resting at your sides and check in on how, how you're feeling. Notice if you might be holding any tension anywhere. And notice your feet on the ground. Feel the ground supporting your feet. Notice where your breath might be. Are you breathing more through your chest or your stomach, your throat? We're gonna take a big inhale and exhale together. So we'll inhale through the nose and exhale through the mouth, letting out a nice sigh. Let's do that once more. Inhale through the nose. And exhale through the mouth. Nice sigh. So we're going to wake up our body by starting with um, massaging the tops of our heads. Just waking up the nerve endings here. And then you'll move down to your face. Get into the sinuses really good. And then you'll massage the throat just by kind of flicking upwards. Get the back of the neck. And then now we're going to pound on our chest and let out a nice ah. So we're going to go ah. And then we'll go down to our bellies. So we'll go oh. And you'll go down the front of your leg. So you're going to pat down the front of your leg and then up the back. So you go down, up the back down, up the back, and then switch to your other leg, down, up the back, you can get your back like this, and then you're going to uh, twist your wrists and your ankles. If you're standing up, you can probably only do one ankle at a time, unless you're a superhuman. And then you'll switch to the other ankle. Keep rotating. And you're gonna knock the webbing between your hand, your fingers. You can pull your fingers, maybe any cracking. Give yourself one more shake, wherever it needs to be shaking. 
<sighs> Let out any breath if you need to. And then return to the starting position. So either seating or standing with your feet planted on the floor, keeping your eyes closed or softly in front of you. Just check in with how you're feeling now. See if anything's moved around. Anything that was stuck, maybe it's now in motion. Maybe you got some new information about parts of your body that you need to take care of. I'm definitely feeling pretty tight in the hamstrings. So we're gonna take one more breath together, inhaling through the nose and a nice exhale through the mouth. So whenever you're ready, you can open your eyes and join us back on the Zoom and I will pass it over to Kyla. Thank you, Lily. That's always wonderful. It's great to do right before having to give a little talk. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Kyla Pascal, and my pronouns are she, her. I'm calling in today from campus, uh, the University of British Columbia, which is on Musqueam territory. I am a planning graduate student at the School of um, Community and Regional Planning. And I focus on Indigenous community planning. Uh, I guess something I'm a little bit excited about in my work right now is I'm doing a practicum with Squamish Nation, working on their comprehensive community plan. And we can dive in to the next slide. So the Transforming Cities from Within Action Research and Facilitation Team curated a learning program for city staff and social innovators from 12 Canadian city-based teams. The majority of these groups are city staff, but they're also a few from other public and nonprofit sectors. The learning journey focused on what we might cultivate within ourselves and what we might nurture around us in order to catalyze transformative and emergent innovations for complex challenges in Canadian cities. Throughout the learning journey, each team rooted their experience in, applied, in an applied challenge at the intersection of climate change, equity, and decolonization, seeking to develop and prototype high impact solutions. The complex, complex challenges being addressed by each city are incredibly different. We have a team creating a process to manage statues and monuments, some with complicated histories in their city. Another team is conducting a water use analysis of public spray parks to a team that is working on how to build a community of practice around intersectional climate and equity work that will be incorporated into city staff work plans. We can go to the next slide, Lily. And so our learning journey, it began in May and it'll end this month. We met monthly or twice a month to cover a variety of session topics, such as imagining possible futures, storytelling, and equity, decolonization, and self in systems. In order to provide a more robust learning journey, we often invited guest speakers to join our sessions to help deepen our thinking and approaches to innovation work. We designed the learning journey in a way to counter mainstream narratives around change making and innovation. It was important to focus on slowing down, self reflection, imagining possible futures, and allowing ourselves to do some deep thinking. We wanted to give ourselves the space to make mistakes, grow, and get uncomfortable. Next slide, please. Embedded in the values, purpose, and practice of innovation for the facilitation team is that innovation needs to move us towards equity, decolonization, and sustainability. We wanted to be ambitious in this learning journey and place emphasis on radical and transformative work. As a diverse team, we locate ourselves as researchers and practitioners who consider Indigenous, critical race, feminist, and queer theory as foundational to our work. Throughout our research, we look to indigenous, indigenous methodologies and deeply analyze the colonial constructs of government and innovation with decolonization always in mind. And while we may be using theories, techniques, and processes that are less common in the public sector, 
and that are often more messy and iterative than the innovation sector might be used to, we still aimed for generative milestones and outcomes along the way. And I'll pass it over to Lindsay now. Thanks, Kyla. So I just want I, the, the framing for this session was a bit methodological. So we just wanted to surface some of the main process, um, process kind of theories that are informing our work. Don't panic. We'll make this won't be too academic. Um, I hope it's very practitioner oriented. So the next slide just um, talks a little bit about what Kyla was saying um, in, in a slightly different way. And that, that is how we're defining what we mean when we use the word innovation in the case of this learning journey. So in the slide notes, you can see the text more fully um, for future reference in case that's helpful for you. But mainly right now, I just wanna make the distinction between a change oriented approach to innovation and the other three, transform, transformation, emergence and resurgence. So many of us will know in, in the public sector, there's a real pressure to kind of maintain the dominant ways of working in the dominant system and take a change orientation to our work. So it means we're making the existing system a little bit more efficient, a little bit more effective, uh, a little bit more user-friendly, user-oriented, service-oriented. Um, but what we're trying to do in this learning journey is really focus more on these ideas around transformative, emergent, and resurgent innovation. So what does it mean to take a really more, uh, a more ambitious approach to innovation in some of the ways that Kyla was just talking about? Uh, and how do we integrate that into our practice? So that's just a little bit about how kind of how we're positioned in this, this big idea called innovation. And the next slide um, shows us a, the model of a community of practice. I think this word, this idea is being used more and more frequently, uh, and there is some great literature behind it. So Etienne and Beverly Winger Trainer um, have a great book and ongoing resource and, and a website with resources on it that talk more about what a community of practice is. Uh, but I just wanted to, to bring this into our, into our conversation today in case um, some of us aren't that familiar with it. So community of practice is a really intentional structure where people are learning and practicing together. And so the domain in our case is the, are these areas of decolonization, equity and climate in cities in Canada. That's kind of the domain that we're working in. Our community is our cohort. And so as Kyla said, they're mostly folks from the public sector. Um, they uh, are, some of them are in, in um, in community organizations and other public sector organizations, and all of them are actively working in their day-to-day -day work on, on some dimension of the domains that we're in. So they're very much practitioners in these spaces. And then Lily's gonna talk more about the practices later, but we do also have a clear set of practices that we are, that we are um, using in the learning journey. And different communities of practice can have different orientations in terms of what we do with those practices. So in our case, so that's what the, the, the next set of circles are. In our case, we're sharing and supporting practice and we're building practice. So we're really working with our, with our members of the cohort to surface and make visible practices that might not be familiar with them um, or familiar to them in their regular work, uh, that we're building networks and connections with one another as we do that. And we're applying our learning and way and reflecting on what we're learning as we apply that. The bottom circle implementing practice is really when the practices are known and you're working to implement them with a high degree of fidelity and influence. So our community of practice isn't there yet. Probably most of us aren't there yet because the practices themselves that many of us work with are still in development, I would say. So that's where our community of practice is, um, is situated. I'm just seeing, um, oh, thanks, James. And then the, the last slide I'll speak to is just about action research. So action research is a, is a qualitative research methodology. Many of us probably use it quite regularly without necessarily knowing that's what it is that we're doing. But it really, I, I wanted to bring in, um, so it's really action, it's, it's working with people that um, are affected most by the, by the problems or challenges that we work on and co-creating knowledge and sharing that knowledge with them. So you're really situating the research in the lived experiences of practitioners and supporting them to be high, you know, to have higher impact and to really learn from what it is that they're trying to do. It is more, it is quite structured. Um, there are, you know, so if um, some of us might sort of do it, um, but it is a quite a robust research methodology. And um, I think it, for me anyway, it's, it, a lot of us maybe are use ethno ethnographic research as well in our practice or user research for more of a design tradition or an anthropological tradition. For me, I think action research is a bit of a stronger approach. It's sort of more fulsome and co-creative than um, 
some of the origins and histories of ethnography that are more extractive and and kind of colonial in nature as an as a research methodology methodology so that's why we've moved into action research i think it's really interesting the folks the the qualitative researchers behind action research who who have been a, who've been at it for many decades are actually in the calling for a more transformative approach to participatory action research to the research community so this is a, i'll just give you a moment to read this quote from hillary bradbury who's a who's been in this field for many many years um, and this comes from a journal that she edits about action research I'll give you a second to just read that So I think it's really interesting how the action research community itself is calling for a more transformative approach to how they do and think about research for these ideas of wrestling with power, um, unsustainability, um, working toward thrive into more mutual transforming, mutual thriving, and, and more towards a more beautiful world. And so that's that's also new in um, as a as a methodology. And I think that's really interesting too. Again, in the chat in the slide. There's a link to the, um, for those of you who are maybe in, in a more academic space, it, there's a fairly accessible editorial from the journal that I think is really interesting too. So that's a little bit about what we've been doing and why and the theories informing our learning journey. And now we wanted to be in dialogue with our team and also with all of you about some of the big questions that we're holding as we move from finishing the learning journey and into writing up what it is that we're, what we've learned through this process. So we have three questions that we're holding and each of those questions is going to be started by um, a member of our team. And then we'd invite you to drop in questions in the chat um, or, or insights in the chat, or there's also some interaction uh, spots for you to um, type in the slides as well if you wanna put your thoughts and um, reflections in there. So I'm gonna hand it over to Maggie to kick us off with our first question. Thank you so much, Lindsay. And before I uh, dive into the question and give a little bit more detail about what we've been doing together, um, I'll just give a quick introduction. So my name is Maggie Lowe and my pronouns are she, her, and I'm joining you from my office at the University of British Columbia on the unceded ancestral and traditional territories of the Haakamunum speaking Musqueam peoples. And I work at UBC as an assistant professor in uh, indigenous community planning. And one of the things that really excites me about my work right now is all of the very um, hopeful collaboration spaces I'm finding myself in, both as a researcher uh, and as a teacher. And um, I've also been really um, privileged this last few months to receive teachings from knowledge holders and community members um, from two of the local First Nations uh, out around Vancouver. And I've been very, um, very excited and grateful for that as well. So I'm, I'm going to draw a little bit. I'm going to talk a, a bit more about um, my question is around what you know transformative participatory action research and what that what that means for us as as a um, as a facilitation team and the research that we're doing and I'm going to draw a little bit from the same article that Lindsay just mentioned because it's it's a really great um, it's a really great piece I think that that uh, helps situate the work that we're doing so in in that article um, by Bradbury uh, it all. There is a call for researchers to critically engage with the production of knowledge um, through a more um, action oriented way, um, more action oriented uh, transformations research is how, how, it, how it's stated. And so instead of maintaining the belief that researchers must hold themselves as objective observers in an inert world, which we know is not possible and I would argue not very helpful, um, we must recognize that human communities are part of a very you know vibrant living planet and so this call comes from the understanding that addressing the complex challenges that are already here that are facing us all in, in cities, um, specifically is what we're looking at in our work, um, and to address the catastrophes, the climate catastrophes that are coming our way and that are basically here, 
This requires questioning the very nature of the way we produce and use our knowledges. And so uh, uh, a question that remains, I think, pretty crucial that we think about, and thinking about this as somebody that works in a university and a researcher is, what if even 10% of the research funds currently given to objectively describing our problems were redirected to relational collaborative learning processes with experiments to provoke future learning? And so through our learning journey, we have been doing just this. Um, and I re, re um, positioned that question just so slightly um, as a group. And so thinking about the question, and it's, it's on slide 13, how have we practiced action research and co-created a space of engagement, openness, reflection, and decolonization? So talking specifically now about, about transforming cities from within. So I'll give a couple of the, a, a few of the juicy details of the work that we've been doing around action, action research. And I'll end with a few questions that are sitting in my mind, and then I'll open it up to my um, amazing esteemed colleagues for a bit of a chat as well as the audience. So, so we've come together um, as a diverse research and facilitation team with a variety of skills and offerings and curiosities and knowledges. So from design, equity, planning, teaching, sustainability, uh, innovation, uh, decolonization work. And we've come together with a shared set of values and commitments. And from the research and facilitation team has been very intentional from the beginning about holding a container for the learning journey that is about reciprocity and love and slowing down and embodying the very types of practices we're hoping to cultivate in our cohort or our community of practice. And you'll hear more about, about those practices from Lily. And we held this container in many ways. And I have, I have provide just a couple of examples. So we started out the learning journey very intentionally by curating a retreat like feel. And again, all of this was online and has been online. Um, so we, we curated a retreat like feel with hosting um, one three hour session for four weeks. Um, so about Tuesday mornings for four weeks. Um, and during those sessions, the facilitation team invited guest experts um, that led the cohort through concepts of positionality and land justice, equity, social emotional intelligence, and imagining possible futures through Afrofuturism and rest as resistance. And this retreat really set the tone for embracing and learning and learning that we need to do and nourishing co-creation, collaboration, and reciprocity. We took time to learn about the histories and stories about the lands on which our cities were built, grappling with what it means to do this work um, on, as uninvited guests on stolen Indigenous lands. And as you experienced from the beginning of this, uh, of this time that we have together, uh, we played beautiful music. We took time to connect with our breath and our bodies in the hopes that folks could land in this, in this space as their authentic selves. And we ended each session with inspiring readings, hoping to provoke a call to possibility. And we tried to cultivate emotion and vulnerability and welcome the discomfort that comes with unlearning and doing the hard work of decolonizing our processes and ourselves. So for example, we practice affinity groups, um, also known as caucusing, in an attempt to unpack uh, tensions that seem to surface um, in a few areas within teams. And our aim was to provide the community of practice um, in this cohort, one of the aims is to provide them with a set of tools and practices that they can take with them to other spaces. And we'll learn more about how um, successful we, our team was at that when we hear the teams uh, as they share their stories of transformation uh, next week and um, during our penultimate learning session together. Um, and we hold, we were able to hold these spaces, I believe, because we cultivated more than just a collaborative and supportive facilitation team. We really held each other up and stayed as flexible and nimble as possible, especially as there are times in our lives um, when you know some of us needed maybe a little extra support or extra time or extra space. Um, this seems little, but we set up really solid communication processes as a facilitation team. So not just email. So from the beginning, uh, we to co-create the slide decks that we used, we used Google Slides. We tracked the learning journey in Mural um, and we were able to um, 
connect the the happenings of each learning session and do our planning over over Slack. Again, this seems small, but I think made made a made a difference. We also met weekly. Um, or almost every week to check in on each other, to plan our upcoming sessions, to share the workload. And while each of us had a particular focus or led certain aspects of each session, um, we all could step in where needed and support, support each other. And ultimately as a facilitation team, we practice relationality and reciprocity in a very deep sense. So I, I'll wrap up um, just by kind of leaving with a few research or questions that are in my mind um, and then I'll, I'll i'll stop talking pass it over to to my colleagues so I, I i've been thinking about you know how do we reimagine research um, to do it in a good way what makes good participatory research in this time of complex challenges and what are key ingredients of a bold strong research and facilitation team undertaking action participatory action research in public innovation spaces and so in specifically in our case what makes up a, a kick-ass facilitation team curating a transformative learning journey for social innovators and so i think I'll, I'll end it there thank you so much for listening thank you maggie i'll just see if kyla or lily or mumby want to add any thoughts about this question to what Maggie just shared. And if anyone else has a comment or a, a question uh, on this, in this domain, in this area, please feel free to drop it in the chat or add it into the slide. I think one of the, the things that I've appreciated in this learning journey is um, being in grad school and in academia and a, and a very colonized institution, um, how we have kind of taken a decolonial approach to the idea around expert and who who is an expert and, and, and expertise and blurring the lines of um, teacher and student, I think has created that, has helped create that container and made space for um, everybody, the cohort and the facilitation team to kind of um, get uncomfortable and make space for these really big systems questions that we're trying to address in only a mere few months, which is a big undertaking. Um, so I've really appreciated that in terms of our, of our research project here. Thanks, Kyla. So we won't have time. So I'm just going to read a couple of the questions that are coming up. Um, team, Maggie, don't feel like you need to be on your own responding to these. And then we can pick up on a couple before we move on to the next question from Mumby. So I'm seeing, how did you identify that a transformative approach was needed? How did you make space for cultural exchanges across language, beliefs, etc.? What does good look like to you? Or how did you settle on that if we have? And then do we think we could have created this environment if the program time scales were different? Is pace incompatible with reciprocity, relational working, et cetera, in your view? You know, if someone wants, if there's something like really grabs you in those questions that someone on our team might like to reply to, and then, um, and then move on to the next question that we're holding. Might be you, Maggie. Yeah, I was just looking at all of them. Sorry, I, I um, all really great questions, and I, I don't want to take up too much time, but um, that's why we have them on the slide. So hopefully we can respond to them after. Um, but the one in the chat, do you think you could have created this environment if the program time scales were different? This is something um, that we talked a lot about and thought thought about, and um, I think the fact that it was over eight months absolutely helped with the. Um, intention of trying to slow down and try to provide these these nourishing spaces and where we can um, arrive and be there um, as ourselves in that in that day. But of course, uh, trying to slow down is very is very difficult. And even as we were planning the sessions and um, you know, session by session, putting the agendas together, you know, we there were some that were very packed. <laughs> um, and we there were a few sessions later on that we realized like we were 
packing in quite a lot. So we actually had a full session, well, not a full, I would say half a session where we kind of had open space for what was emerging. So those tensions absolutely um, of, you know, those timelines, those deadlines, what are the outcomes um, are all, we're always kind of there. But I, I do think that if we can be in, as intentional, intentional about these acts of reciprocity, um, of slowing down as rest, as resistance, we really brought that concept in at the beginning and tried to, or in those four uh, beginning sessions and tried to bring that up time and time again throughout the session. So um, it's a challenge for sure, but I think there are a lot of things that we can do uh, along the way um, to, to slow down and to make it as uh, relational as we can within, within the container. Thank you, Maggie, and thanks everyone for your questions. So our team's going to be typing away um, in response to your questions too, just because there's there's only so many things that we can say out loud together. So we'll, we'll do that throughout the session. And at this point, I'd love to invite uh, Mumby into the room, into our virtual room to share some thoughts about uh, one of the second big questions that we're holding. Awesome, thank you so much, uh, Lindsay and Maggie and, and Kyla for setting the stage and starting the conversation for us. Um, my name is Mombi Maina, my pronouns are she and her. I am zooming in today from the unceded traditional territories of the Han Kaminam and the Skohomish speaking peoples in Burnaby, which is part of the greater Vancouver area. Uh, and I am a social planner. Um, with the city of Vancouver uh, in the social policy department. And one of the exciting things that I am learning um, as, as I do uh, work in the equity space, we just completed the, the development of the city's first equity framework. Uh, and now that work is, is, is shifting into implementation and I have been supporting work on, on the accessibility strategy. And one of the things that I'm learning is that I am, uh, an able-bodied person, but that is a temporary state. So I, I introduce myself uh, nowadays as I am a temporary, really able-bodied woman because um, even those of us who are able-bodied at some point in our lives, uh, we move towards uh, our bodies functioning differently. And so what does it mean to, to walk in this world, to work and to, to plan the city and knowing that our ability is temporarily and, and, and how do we consider things differently as, as such. Uh, so yeah, that's a little bit of the work that I'm doing at the city of Vancouver. And the question that we have been sitting with uh, in, in, in terms uh, of this, you know, public uh, sector innovation and in our shared learning is how we, um, what, what are we learning about working at the intersection of climate equity, climate, climate change, equity, and decolonization that might inform uh, public sector innovation or, or innovators. And you know, these, these, these challenges are definitely some of the uh, most pressing, most urgent, most um, wicked, as so, so to speak, problems or challenges of our 21st century. And everybody, the globally, we're grappling with, with what it means to uh, talk about climate change. What, what are the consequences? How, how do we mitigate? How do we respond? How do we do uh, that in an equitable way? And how do we address the, the rising global inequities, social inequities within a, a colonized, uh, a colonial system? And so one of the things that we are early on talking about is the need to name these root causes of, of the problem. So to name colonialism, to name um, the overconsumption, to name the governance structures that have brought us to where we are and as planners and as cities and as uh, people who work to, uh, to envision you know, a better future is, is really naming uh, who, what is the, at the center of these inequities, what is creating the gaps, the rising gaps between the haves and the have nots. So we have been uh, talking about having the courage to name the systems and recognizing that this work is both personal and professional. So we, like Maggie said, we began our session with really talking about uh, positioning ourselves. Who are we? How, how um, what are the histories that inform us as planners? What are, as city government uh, workers, 
What are the assumptions that we hold? What are the backgrounds and the histories of our families um, that are mostly, you know, grounded on dominant systems uh, of our society? And how do we start to talk about um, power and privilege and to question those? I like the quotes that, that Lindsay put, put there about really uh, having, having the courage to question whose knowledge matters and whose methodologies matter and how, how do we engage with the power dynamics, right? So how do we challenge the status quo and, and start to imagine our position and our place in replicating these structures and dominant systems that have gotten us to where we are today? So again, like Maggie said, we, we, we had these conversations about, you know, caucusing or affinity staff group or you know community sessions that helps us to think about what does it mean to to be planning and to be working at the city as a black woman as an indigenous person as somebody who has disabilities as a white person right so oftentimes we don't name whiteness but what is that uh, what is this white supremacy uh, culture and how is that replicated and perpetuated within the systems that we have and so again, bridging uh, the personal and the professional and really understanding that um, these questions are not questions that we, that we ask at work and leave in the evening when we go home, but we carry these conversations, we carry these questions with us to our dinner tables, to our kitchen tables and conversations in community, so that as we transform, uh, we look to transform our cities and our communities, that transformation starts from within and stemming into the, the colleagues and the structures that, that we're seeking to, to shift. The other thing we're also learning is about how this work is interconnected. Our education systems are built to have different you know, departments. So there's a lot of siloing right from the education that we get. And that continues into the work that we do at, at cities and at, at communities. And we have departments that are dealing with climate change. We have departments that are dealing with equity issues, uh, engineering. So we are very disconnected, right? So one of the things we're we are learning is the need to, to see these issues as interconnected as they are and to start to break those departmental silos and coming together. And one of the ways we did that is initially when uh, these communities of practice have been run, we've invited individuals to come, but this time we actually challenged the cohort to come as teams, right, across departments so we can have that um, cross um, um, connections and collaboration and co-creation. And we also invited the, the cohort to also have identify a circle of support who would be able to help them through this journey, right? So again, emulating and embodying some of those practices that we're looking to, uh, to have and to cultivate. And then the other thing too, in terms of uh, co-creation and collaboration, we are thinking about the value uh, of hearing and bringing to the table the voices that have often been left unheard, voices that have been ignored, that have been devalued, that have not been at the decision-making uh, tables and conversations, and really valuing the expertise of the people on the ground. Our communities are experts of their own lives, and so who better to inform and to help us to find solutions to these problems? So again, moving into uh, away from you know experts as only the people who are policy making policies and bringing in communities and working with communities together. So I think um, you know I'll stop there for now. But but uh, one of the things that I, I want to put on the table is um, for for us to think about is how do we bring, we're talking about reciprocity, co-creation, how do we do that in a good way? How do we bring community voices, voices that have been on the margins into the conversation, into the, the processes that we're hoping to create together? And if anybody has anything to add there or any questions to, to offer, please go, go ahead uh, and, and do that right now. Thanks, Mabi. So I'll see if anyone in our team wants to add anything to what you've just shared. And then if you've got questions or comments, um, drop those in the chat or on slide 14.
thanks Mumbi for um I'm I'm glad that we're we have this opportunity to uh reflect on the work we're doing in such a detailed way so it's 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 always such a joy to listen to you talk about the work the work that we're doing um and yeah I there was a question and similar because you ended like how do we do this in a good way and there's a similar question on uh, that came from um, on the slide above when I was talking and um, that's a really it's a really good one that I'm I'm really trying to think through and what's coming to mind is you know how are we doing it in a way where we're thinking through um, decolonizing um, practices, like decolonizing ourselves and the processes along the way. If we can kind of add insights to that, to those journeys in the way that we're doing it, I think I think part of that is doing this work in a good way. Yeah. Thanks, Maggie. Um, the other thing too that, that uh, I wanna put out there is that idea that this work is, is both personal and professional, right? So there's no difference between those two pieces. And I think that the, the invitation to uh, the embodiment exercise by Lily that we need to be attuned to what's happening in our bodies. And also really starting to question and to interrogate some of those dominant assumptions and values that we bring and the norms that we bring. So daylighting those and bringing those to the, fore, to the foreground. I wonder how people are experiencing that, the participants, uh, the invitations to think about anti-Black racism, anti-Indigenous racism, to think about the inequities that we see uh, and being challenged uh, as, as, as people coming from dominant cultures. How is that sitting with people? What are some tensions that we're holding? Um, and how can we use those to not as conversation stoppers, but uh, as you know, enablers of you know, uh, launching pads for more conversations, right? Thank you, Mumbi and Maggie. So there's some great questions um, in the slide that maybe Mumbi you can have a look at as we and then write in some thoughts about um, as we move over to Lily's big question. So Lily, I'll hand it over to you. All right, thank you. Thanks everyone so far. It's really nice to, yeah, just like listen and reflect on um, what we've been working on for the past few while, or last past, past few months. Um, so I realized that I didn't get to say what I was excited about working on uh, when I introduced myself. So I'll just um, say that uh, something that I'm really excited that I'm working on um, coming up in a few weeks is, um, uh, Lindsay and I are actually uh, delivering a speculative fiction writing workshop um, with a systems design uh, community of practice in, based out of Edmonton, Alberta. And so I'm really excited to, uh, so speculative fiction was something that was a part of the um, initial kind of uh, retreat um, sort of immersion um, in the beginning of our practices and um, just thinking about how that could be a tool for public sector innovators to, um, to imagine possible futures and think beyond uh, the current dominant structures and um, the current um, complex challenges that, um, that they're wrestling with and addressing. So that's something I'm really excited about. And um, I think my question definitely relates to a lot of what Maggie and Mumbi have already been um, reflecting on, but it's um, basically what, how are we working across competencies, capacities, and capabilities to build practices for transformative innovation. And um, on my slide, uh, you can see we've got, um, it's our kind of theory of change of, of what this uh, learning journey has been about. Um, it's kind of based off of a um, turtle shell. So kind of what we need to have, um, what we're taking along with us as we go through um, as we work towards transformative innovation. Um, so it's practicing all of these 10 practices um, for the purpose of transformative innovation on climate equity and decolonization in cities. So I'll talk a little bit about um, some of the practices and the different uh, ways that we're thinking about them. And so on the top layer, we have these sort of visionary practices of um, um, kind of these larger uh, shifts that we're holding or, or weight practices that will get towards these shifts that we're holding, such as imagining and enacting visionary futures, 
um, embodying agency and accountability. This relates back to um, what Mumbi and Maggie were, were sharing about, um, you know, recognizing ourselves in systems and, and seeing where we do have agency and accountability, uh, where we have agency to make um, shifts and also um, as public sector innovators that we have a pretty strong um, um, an important role and responsibility and how can we be accountable to those um, who, especially those who are, um, are often left out of these uh, decision-making processes. And then um, generating abundance was another visionary practice. And um, so yeah, this, this kind of idea of, of creating a container that doesn't feel, um, that doesn't reinforce this sort of scarcity mentality that is ever present in, um, in a lot of different areas of, our, of the current system that we're living and working in, um, but rather um, creating a space where, where we do uh, have time to explore these things. We do have um, multiple resources and that we have different sort of relationships and connections that we haven't yet perhaps tapped into um, as readily. And so creating this, this sense of abundance. Um, and then the middle layer is um, these public sector innovation practices. So more specific to the public sector of committing to inclusion, equity, and um, justice, thinking and acting systemically, um, crafting through experimentation and iteration. So that was a big part of the learning journey was embracing that we're, we're not um, working towards expertise at this point, but we're working through, um, through trying new things and through um, exploring something that's unknown and, and trying and trying again, so very iterative. Um, and just rethinking our, our complex challenge questions, uh, revisiting them constantly to, to check in on if that's what we're um, still learning or is that what we're still questioning or is there a new question that may have emerged? And then nourishing co-creation, collaboration and reciprocity. Um, so yeah, Mumbi definitely talked about this, about how we, how we do this knowing that we, we aren't all experts in, in our um, in what we practice and especially in these complex challenge environments so we need sort of more of a collaborative co-creative um, space and then there's also the inward oriented personal practices of um, you know how do we as individuals kind of need to be in order to to build these practices and to stay in this space of um, transformative innovation um, so these are related to cultivating courage and vulnerability embracing an unlearning orientation um, staying with amb ambiguity and discomfort. So again, being in a complex challenge environment where there's many, um, many possible directions and also many unknowns, um, it can be very, very uh, disruptive for someone who perhaps is coming from a traditional um, public sector workplace or environment where there's the project plan and like the particular goals that people are working towards. Um, it's a challenge to perhaps step into a space where we're not exactly sure of what the outcome might be. And so I think through our learning journey and through the container that we've crafted, we've done, um, we've been really committed to kind of uh, ensuring that being able to practice these things, that people are safe and, and comfortable or safe and um, able to practice these things, knowing that there will you know, still be discomforts that come along the way. And so really we're working at basically um, all these different scales from the personal up to the team and organizational level and into the systemic level and kind of integrating and practicing them throughout. Um, and some of the practices have been, we've had specific sessions that are really working um, focusing on those for example the um, enacting visionary futures we had the specific imagining possible future session and then others are woven kind of throughout the different tools and um, approaches that we're that we're working on um, and then I think also a big part of uh, supporting building practice is us as a facilitation team modeling what it's like to build these practices so how are we um, being vulnerable or courageous and you know how are we staying with discomfort that we might be having um, and again yeah this idea of generating abundance how can we ensure that we're not you know overloading the session or um, trying to stuff too much into the session so um, kind of as Kylo was saying with like breaking down this distinction between expert and um, 
and student, we as facilitators are also learning and building these practices and kind of changing along the way. So um, yeah, I think I'll leave it there and open it up to anyone else if anyone wants to add anything else or if there's any questions. I can't see the questions. So if someone wants to let me know what they are, um, that'd be great. Thanks, Lily. There, um, there aren't any questions in the slide yet that I'm seeing, but please feel free to add those there and see if there's any, any other comments from our team about practices. I might add one just because I know Jesper and I actually have talked about this over the years in a lot of ways. And there's, there's a lot of toolkits and techniques and tools that you can find out there. And I think that are all helpful and useful and also I find can be a little bit overwhelming sometimes. And so what we were really trying to do with this, this um, framework was to give us a way to curate the right tools for the particular version of innovation, the particular in intersection of challenges that we were working on that were um, appropriate and that also really drew from these foundations of, of methodologies around action research and co-creation decolonization and equity in our practices. So hopefully that, that comes through in this, um, in the way that we've shaped how we're describing practices. Mm -hmm. So there's a couple here, Lily and team. Um, how collective or massive do we need to build these practices to have an impact? Just a small question. I don't know if anyone wants to reflect on that one. Hmm. Yeah, that's a really great, great, huge question. Um, I, yeah, it's, I mean, I think that's something that we definitely think a lot about is kind of how, how do these practices, how do we scale these practices or how do we scale what we're doing? Um, or, um, but there's also like different levels of scaling. And that's something that I've really loved from um, just learning from Lindsay's work is there's different ways to scale. So it might be scaling more deeply into like inner work actually, or scaling um, laterally, maybe across different um, collaborations or potential, uh, you know, teams or ways of working together. So, yeah, I mean, I think that be because we're working at multiple scales all the time, um, there's, and there's always room for doing more internal work and starting with um, the kind of person at the personal level often seems maybe the most tangible or the kind of um, most in reach, I think. And so I'm also kind of curious about how we how we continue to reach more inward um, and uh, really cultivate these practices at the individual level. But I'm curious what other people think about scaling it outwards to a larger impact. I think I might just um, reference uh, down in a few slides, we have a few uh, resources to look at. And, and the idea of the collective really makes me think of the work um, of Adrienne Marie Brown, and she covers this in Emergent Strategy, but the idea of uh, fractal theory. And so kind of um, the idea that like what you do on the, on the personal, on the individual, you can scale it out. Um, and I think, uh, it's a lot easier <laughs> in, in considering uh, these big systems ideas and these, it's absolutely daunting to, you know, be like climate change. Let's quickly figure that out. Um, <laughs> and then thinking more uh, internally and individually and thinking of how these, and not so much in it like an individualistic um, way or that like, you know, if we just all start recycling, then we're going to solve everything but the kind of the idea that these 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 small uh inner workings and like local and like re locality and regionality and community can be scaled out into these like larger systems and i think that the work that we're doing here is like a really great example of these these kind of nested systems of individual family community globally um work that that is possible um, I feel like it's a little bit easier to, to think about and wrap my head around anyways. 
There's one more question here that might be a nice one for each of us to like briefly say something about um, to close on, which is what it, well, someone asked for 10, feels like an arbitrary number. Let's say four, because there are four of four or maybe five, I'll jump into. What are the five most overlooked, maybe overlooked skills that people need for this work? I, the foundational things that, or the basics that might get forgotten in lieu of more complex, shiny things. So my team, my colleagues, have you got one? What's the foundational, one foundational essential? We'll do a round on that and then we'll close. Um, I think, uh, I think, I think humility is a big thing for me um, and, and openness because the humility to know, to kind of admit that we're not experts of everything and that we have a long way to go and to learn from others. So that openness, um, when when communities when communities or colleagues invite us to step into our own um, messiness or privilege or power, and how do we take that as 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 a, as a good offering instead of seeing it as an attack or a criticism, right? So so having the humility to hear out. Uh, when alternative perspectives are being presented and different invitations to to be and to know and to um, do differently come in. So I think those are the two that I'll offer. I, I cannot, thanks Mummy. That, that was great, humility. You took my openness one, so I quickly pivoted. Um, <laughs> um, one that comes up a lot for me is for folks and the, I'm just as, I'm in this as well. I work on it is being able to let go of this. Okay. What are the intended outcomes of what I'm doing? What, what am I trying to get to? Um, you need to kind of let go of always knowing exactly where you're, where you're, what the goal is um, and be okay with kind of ambiguous messiness. Uh, I can I can answer. Um, I think I'm not sure if it's so much of a, of a skill or or what the the tools or resources uh, could be around it, but I really have been interested in the work of, um, and it kind of speaks to what I was just talking about, but our own personal healing, because um, I think it makes space for the, the messiness and uncomfortability because so much so many of these big system questions, when you kind of boil it down, often speak to our, our individual lived experience, the ways that we grew up, our families, like so many things that are so, um, these kind of tender touch points. And so I think if, um, and I, I feel like it in <laughs> like academia and so much of, of these institutions, when you talk about healing, people kind of, I think, roll their eyes and are like, oh, you know, have some certain feelings about it. But in and of itself, um, I think there's this problem, right, that, that you start thinking about um, healing ourselves and like and doing the work um, and people get uncomfortable. And I think it's it is that uncomfortability that we can we can find these these areas of change and growth for ourselves. So I would say kind of healing work. These are also great. I feel like each one I'm like, oh yeah, that's what I mean. That's what I mean. <laughs> um, I, I think just building on all of those is, um, yeah, I don't know if it's necessarily a skill either, but kind of like an awareness that everything that we're doing exists in relationships. And so really, I think being like grounded in that, in that knowing that this is relational work, whether it's um, you know your relationship to yourself and how you're experiencing whatever it is that you're working on, or whatever it is like whatever discomforts might be coming up, or um, you know relationships with others, and um, and that this isn't just you know like this one way sort of transactional or extractive sort of um, space that is needed it's it's really about this sort of idea of reciprocity and how we how what does um you know what you're doing and re reflect or impact what i'm doing and um just like remembering that everything exists in relationships to one another i think is a big one 
Thanks, everyone. And thanks to whoever um, asked that question. That's such a great question. So I'll, um, I'll make, I think mine at this moment anyway is, is, is would be remembering that there are many different ways to know and to be, and uh, even in really constrained feeling places like the public sector, we can show up and in different ways and draw from different knowledge sources and wisdom sources in, in the work that we're doing. And in the spirit of that, I'll just read something quickly um, here to close us out and then hand it back over to you, James. So Lily brought this amazing book to us uh, in our journey, Undrowned by, hopefully you can see that, by Alexis Pauline Gums. And I'm just gonna read a short piece um, from here to close us out. So from the sky, a dolphin pod of Lysadelphus, the black and white dolphins with no fins, which travel by the hundreds up to 3000 strong, would look like a smooth black continent of movement. From underwater, it would look like a white cloud that somehow submerged. That's how I imagine it. Collectively echolocating for food, they would be impossible to ignore. Though only a few come to the surface at a time, they travel by the hundreds or thousands, so sleek. And their cousins, other dolphins with fins, not so smooth, they welcome them into the pod too. That's how I think about us sometimes. Those of us who have chosen to move together through this, we are perceived so distinctly from different directions. Human observers mistake Lysadelphus for seals or sea lions, or even for penguins sometimes which is to say, maybe it's not so much about being recognized as who we are, as it is about staying together, feeding each other, knowing where we are and moving through. Our love to our pod in all directions, the smooth and the not quite so smooth, those of you showing your back and those showing your belly, those of you breaking through the surface and those staying in the deep. It's an honor to be in the midst of you. Look around, listen out, here we are. Thanks everybody. Thanks to my team and to all of you for joining us today. And back over to you, James. Thanks team. Thanks, uh, Lindsay. Um, so I'm gonna pick that up. Uh, James allowed me to. Uh, that, was, uh, that was such a inspiring and, and comforting place to be uh, taking the space with you in the, in the last uh, 75 minutes. Um, a very deep reflection as she rarely had it, uh, particularly on Zoom calls, certainly. So really appreciate you enabling that and then sharing your experiences uh, in this past, past time with us. Um, I'm certainly going to take a lot of things away thinking about uh, particularly how decision makers are in processes of unlearning uh, constantly and certainly the characteristics that you were highlighting, being comfortable with not knowing having humility, being okay with ambiguity, attention to personal healing, uh, doing seeing your work as relational and, and uh, cherishing different ways of knowing. These are all right at the heart and the center of, you know, the transformations of, of governments and institutions. So I can't really think of a better kind of segue uh, in this journey and this learning journey of institutional innovation to, to so, so thank you for, for sharing that and, 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 and bringing that to the, to the fore of, of this. Um, I guess for now, um, thank you everyone for joining. And uh, as I said, the journey goes on. Uh, tonight we'll actually talk about what those skills of decision makers uh, should be. What is the, the very modern public servant look like? And I'll certainly try to bring those qualities into the mix uh, as a starting point uh, for one thing. But then, as you can also see here, uh, we have a, some interesting sessions coming up tomorrow around learning organizations, hearing from the UNDP, around innovation labs, which I think Lindsay will join again, luckily, uh, and also about uh, social R&D ecosystems, hearing from other experiences, both from Canada and Australia and, and, other, and other places. And then the final day, we'll talk a little bit more about specifically about policy and missions. So with that, thank you. And have a have a great evening and and uh, morning or wherever you are. Uh, have a great day. Uh, great to see you all.